my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow has helped millions of new and expecting parents discover the breastfeeding and postpartum essentials covered by their insurance, including breast pumps, maternity compression, and lactation education and support. They take care of everything, including all paperwork, working with your insurance company, and explaining your options to get these free essentials. Aeroflow offers all major breast pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansano, Amida, LV, Willow, and more. All you have to do is go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. Extra bonus, if you use the coupon code birthhour15 in their online shop, you'll get 15% off all supplies and accessories. Head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get started. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Megan all about her experience using Aeroflow Breast Pumps to get her breast pump for free through insurance. I'd love to take a minute to tell you about our online childbirth course called Know Your Options. This course takes you from the final weeks of pregnancy all the way through preparing for birth and postpartum, as well as a bonus course all about pumping, storing milk, and preparing to go back to paid work if that's part of your plan. You can see all the different modules laid out for you and more information at thebirthhour.com slash course. When you sign up for the Know Your Options course, you get lifetime access and instant access. So you can work at your own pace and we would love to have you join the private Facebook group for that course, as well as our bi-weekly Zoom calls. So again, head over to thebirthhour.com slash course to get all of the info and use the coupon code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. We'd also love to tell any new listeners who haven't heard that we have a Patreon group. You can head over to patreon.com slash birth hour to see all the information there about how to support the podcast and in return get fun perks and bonuses such as access to our archived episodes and our private Facebook group for our Patreon members. So again, that's patreon.com slash birth hour. Today's guest is Enya and she has three stories to share, a home birth and then a surrogacy birth. And finally, a cesarean due to a placenta previa. All right, let's hear from Enya. Hi, Enya. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Of course. I'm excited to hear all your different stories. Before we get to that, can you tell people a little bit about you and your family? Yeah. So my name is Enya, and uh, I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, In my family, I have my partner, Mike. We've been together nine years. And then I have my son, Maxwell, who is six, and my son, Lyndon, who is seven months. I also was a surrogate, and I carried for a man who lives in Barcelona, and uh, I carried his daughter for him. Okay, so we're going to hear all these different stories today, but let's go ahead and start with your first pregnancy and what that looked like for you. Yeah, definitely. So I wanted to start off by saying that I have been so into pregnancy and birth, like I can trace it back to my childhood. (laughs) It's just been my passion. So when I got a little older, that passion grew when I was able to witness my friend have her baby when we were 19. And um, it was through uh, around that time that I started looking into doulas and midwives. I started really looking into home birth and unmedicated birth. And so when I got pregnant with my son in the spring of 2016, I knew right away that I wanted to have a home birth. And uh, so I found some midwives as soon as I could. And um, we're lucky here in Canada that midwives and OB care is all free. And it's also nice because midwives here, we, uh, from what I understand in the States, there's home births and hospital births with midwives. But here in Canada, it's nice because they deliver kind of anywhere you choose and you can change your mind at any point. But yeah, I found um, midwives and uh, there were three in my group and they were all wonderful. I was pretty young when I got pregnant with my first, but the, the pregnancy was very easy. I honestly really enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, it was, I worked a pretty physical job at the time, but I was able to work pretty late in my pregnancy uh, before I decided to take off at like 37 weeks or something. And um, 
that was kind of it. It was it was uh, not not too much to it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> I was very fortunate. It was <laughs> pretty easy. Yeah, yeah. We like we like boring, <laughs> quote unquote, boring pregnancies, right? Yeah. Um, and sounds like you really enjoyed it too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So then, what about your birth? Yeah. So my midwives were super hands off and they were, uh, because everything looked great. Uh, they were happy to let me go pretty late. And, um, so I was due in February and, uh, I had an appointment with my midwives, uh, when I was 40 weeks and four days and I went in and I was, it was getting a little uncomfortable at that point. It wasn't terrible, but I was, you know, again, I was feeling pretty big at that point. Um, so they did uh, offer to do a sweep that day. And I asked them and they told me that it wouldn't induce labor, um, <laughs> and which I now know is, is not the truth. But I thought that it would just like maybe, I don't really know what I expected of it to be totally honest with you. But um, I ended up getting a sweep that day and it wasn't, it wasn't uncomfortable. It was fine. And then they were like, okay, you know, you look great. Everything looks good. You know, have a great Valentine's Day. It was February 14th. So yeah, I went on my day and um, we have a tradition in my family. Um, since I was two years old, uh, my family has dinner at Dairy Queen on Valentine's Day. Um, it's just our, our little tradition. So uh, I had my sweep and then we immediately, my partner and I were headed to Dairy Queen to meet uh, my mom, my sister to have dinner. And on the way there, I was starting to feel a little bit crampy, nothing too crazy, but it was, it was a little uncomfortable. And so we got to Dairy Queen and we arrived there first and we're standing in line waiting for food and I'm starting to feel more cramps. And I, and I, I kind of sit there, I'm just standing in line and I, and I stand there and I, and I really focus on them for a second. I'm like, oh, these have, uh, these have a peak to them and then they're coming back down and they're also happening really quickly. Um, so I just kind of, you know, kept that to myself and we got our food. My mom, my sister arrived. So we all sat down and my mom notices pretty quickly that I'm, I'm not super talkative and I'm, I'm being pretty quiet. And she looks at me and she's like, are you, you okay? And I looked at her and I'm like, I think I'm having contractions. And she's, and so everyone gets all excited and, and I'm like, yeah, but they're coming really quickly. And so we start timing and they're coming every like five minutes, but they weren't like, they weren't really bad. They were, they were pretty mild. They were just uncomfortable. And so I, you know, finish eating, not knowing that this is going to be the last thing I eat for the next while. <laughs> of course, it was a burger. Um, and I say to my mom, like, I need to go home. I need to get in the bath. Like, this isn't terrible, but I am uncomfortable. I need to have a bath and lay down. So we, we leave, we go home, and I get in the bathtub. And I hang out there for a while. The, the, it doesn't slow them down. The contractions are still coming. And so I get out of the bath after a while, and I, I call my midwife. And she's like, okay, she wanted me to wait until they were, I mean, they were five minutes apart at that point already, um, but she wanted to wait till they were lasting a minute or maybe that, that they were getting worse. In any case, it was my first birth, so I was probably a little oversensitive to them. And so I told, I, I called back pretty quickly saying like, oh yeah, we need to, <laughs> we need to meet up. So we lived in a small apartment at the time. So we had planned to go to my mother's house, which was pretty close by uh, to, for the birth. Uh, so we told the midwife we were heading over there. We packed up and we, we headed over to my mom's. We get there and my partner starts setting up the birth pool uh, in the living room. And I just start walking the stairs and I'm telling my mom, I'm like, oh, this isn't so bad. And she gives me a look like, uh-huh, yeah, that's <laughs> sure. And uh, the midwife arrives. And she uh, just we we decide to to check me. And uh, as she's checking, she's like, "Are you having a contraction right now?" And of my three midwives, there was one that I didn't get along with as well. And this was the midwife who was on call that night. And so she's checking me, and she's like, "Are you having a contraction?" And, I, and I'm like, "I think so," which was super embarrassing because I had called her over, and it's like. Mm, 10 p.m. now and she leaves me a look like you know <laughs> we didn't need to call me over yet and I'm like I felt really bad and so I still don't know to this day but I'm wondering if maybe it maybe it was just the check maybe she gave me another quick sweep 
But for whatever reason, she finishes and she's like, okay, I'm going to go home for a while because it's getting late. I'm going to get some sleep. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's fair. And so I go to the washroom and on my way, I get this massive contraction. It just brings me down to my knees. And I look at her and I'm like, uh, (laughs) what? And she's like, well, that didn't last a minute. So I'm still going to go. And and you go ahead and you just, you know, try to sleep, try to relax. I was like, okay. So she leaves and uh, I go upstairs and I get into the bathtub in my mom's room. And, uh, and it gets rough real fast at this point. It's, I go from them being like uncomfortable to them being like really tensing my body for every wave. And um, my friend arrives at this point, I'd invited her to be at the birth. And so everyone's now there who's going to be. And um, I tried to relax in the bathtub and then I got out and I tried to relax in bed and it just wasn't working. It was really painful. Um, so we, after, it was about an hour later and we called the midwife again. And she, after listening to me go through a contraction, she's like, oh yeah, that sounds a bit, a bit more like it. Um, so she comes back and she checks me and I think I'm at mm, like a five now or something. So she's like, okay, well, let's, let's all settle in for the ride. And I kind of move around the living room and we filled up the birth pool. So I'm, I'm in and out of that because I keep on getting too warm when I'm in the birth pool. And around this time, I start to just like go so into myself. <laughs> when I talk to my sister and my partner later about it, they say that I was on a different planet. I had just gone inward and like they would ask me questions and I couldn't even respond. It wasn't because I was like so in, in so much pain. I was just like, like it was almost like I was high. It was crazy. So we go through that and I get to a point where I start to feel kind of pushy. And so I get out and the midwife checks me and she's like, okay, you're at a nine and a half. You, there's, there's, a, there's a cervical lip. So she tries to move it and she's like, no, we, we're, we're going to need to, you're going to need to breathe through these contractions for a while to, to let, the, let yourself dilate fully. So I get back into the tub and I'm, you know, going in different positions to try and help myself. And um, at some point I, I remember looking at my boyfriend and I just and said, can we please, please, please go to the hospital? And he knew that that was, of course, not what I wanted to do. Um, but I, I was I was kind of ticked. Uh, the midwife looked at me and she's like, yeah, sure. You know, if, you, if that's what you want, then we can go. And it was something about her saying it so casually when she knew that it was not what I wanted um, that made me go like, excuse me, no, um, I'm, I'm in this. <laughs> so we're going to do this. So I continued, and uh, when I look back at pictures, I was breathing through these contractions, trying so hard not to push for like almost three hours, which was really intense. And at some point during this, I did get out, and the midwife did break my water to help and encourage the progression. And I think that did, it made things a lot more intense, but it did help because I did finally dilate to, to 10. And so I get out, and she checks me, and she says that I'm 10. And again, this part I don't understand, but I had made it very clear that I wanted to have a water birth. Like, that was my plan, was to have a water birth, and I made it very clear in my appointments that that's what I wanted. And she looks at me and she says, oh, I don't let first time moms birth in the water. And I, I still don't understand that. At the time, I was just like, I don't care. Just just get this baby out of me. I Whatever. But when I go back to it now, that kind of makes me angry because I totally could have. Yeah. And to not have that brought up at all before when you said you wanted a water birth. Yeah. It, and and I, I've even asked my midwives in future pregnancies and none of them can figure it out like why she would have said that and I would have thought that maybe I even made it up but my mother heard it as well and she was also just as confused so I know that it did it did happen I wasn't crazy yeah uh, yeah, yeah and I'm I'm, uh, I'm still kind of mad about that you know many years later but you know yeah in any case so I said you know fine just we'll just get this baby out and so I pushed on the couch, on my side, on my back, on the toilet. And it just wasn't working. Um, they could see his head, but he, and they would watch, they, he would move down. And then as soon as I would stop pushing, he would move right back up again. So he was kind of stuck. And bless my sister's heart, at this point, she goes on Facebook and she updates it to that I am crowning. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> gotta love, <laughs> gotta love sisters. <laughs> oh she, did, she didn't know, she didn't know the, co- the correct terms or really what was happening. <laughs> but I still have to laugh about that to this day. Anyways, so I pushed for about, at this point it had been about three hours and uh, she had called the backup midwife and they were trying to get me in different positions. You know, like I said, the toilet and then back to the couch and this and that. And I was, I was getting really tired. Um, I was feeling like I, I couldn't breathe between contractions. Like when I wasn't pushing, it felt like I just couldn't catch my breath. And um, the midwives at one point, both of them put like their fingers in me and they like tried to physically move my bones like during a contraction, which was horribly painful. But I, you know, I understood that they were trying to do what they could um, when we were trying everything. So we just, we kept at that for, for a long time. And at some point I was on the toilet and my midwife comes up to me and she says, Hey, Anya, we had gone through the night and this is now into the next day around, uh, one or two o'clock. So it's been almost 20 hours since my labor first began. And so she comes into the washroom and she tells me, she's like, Hey, Anya, I've been, I've been up all night with you. And, um, at this point, I'm not feeling like I'm quite safe to be here anymore because I haven't gotten any sleep. So I'm going to switch off with the next midwife. And I'm like, yep, that's fine. Totally understand. And so she leaves and who arrives next is, and I think this played a big part in it, but the next midwife who arrives was a midwife that I got along with really well. And I really, really liked And so I had gone back onto the couch and she sat down next to me and she said, Hey, Anya, you've been at this for a while. Um, She said, we're, we're getting really close to the point. Like, and, and luckily baby was really happy this whole time. They kept checking his heart rate. He was happy. He had thankfully had no problems with all this pushing. And so she said, we know we're, he's, he's looking good, which is great, but we're getting to the point where we're going to have to look at a hospital transfer and, I was like, yep, I I understand. And she's like, you know, we'll we'll give you another few pushes and and we're going to have to do that. And I'm like, yep, I I understand. And so at this point, I don't know why, probably just because I was in labor land, but I had been refusing to squat. Don't know why. Um, But she said to me, she's like, yeah, I really, I wonder if we could get you to get into a squat here. I think it might help. And I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. Fine. And so my boyfriend sat behind me on the couch and he put his feet like underneath my butt and I went into a squat and it was really beautiful. Every time I had a contraction, I would push and he would lift his feet so that it would tilt my pelvis a bit. And wouldn't you know it in 10 minutes, my son was born. <laughs> Like we went from so much pushing to just like something about that squat, something about his health, (laughs) something, probably something about being with a midwife who I loved. Mm. I think that had a big part in it. And uh, out he flew and they did ask me as he was uh, coming out, they're like, do you want to catch him? I'm like, "Uh, like my, my arms don't even work anymore. They're jelly. (laughs) You go for it. (laughs) Yeah. It's hard when you're squatting too. (laughs) Oh, exactly. Um, and uh, she had a student with her, so they, that, I guess that was her, stu- her student's first two-handed catch, which was kind of fun. Uh, so he was born, they put him right on my chest, and <laughs> the cone head on this child, <laughs> oh my goodness, from being stuck and for it's so long in the, in the birth canal. Oh my goodness, they said it was one of the worst cone heads they have seen. Um, and because he had been rubbing on the same spot for hours, he also had a really bad bruise on the top of his head, but he was fine. He came out screaming and he was healthy as can be no problems other than, you know, that bruise on his head, which, you know, we didn't really have to do much about. And, uh, yeah, that was it. They, they waited till the cord stopped pulsing to, uh, cut it and deliver my placenta. And, and that was it. He was, he was here. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing how quickly those cone heads can just fix themselves, but oh, it can be kind of goodness. alarming at first. <laughs> and that was the first thing I have it on video. And the first thing I did was look at him and said, oh, look at your head. <laughs> <laughs> You've been on a long journey. He really had. <laughs> uh, okay. So maybe just tell us a little bit about how postpartum was and then what led you to wanting to become a surrogate. Uh, Yeah. So postpartum luckily was really easy. Uh, He did have a tongue tie, which we got fixed really quickly. And then, you know, 
that was really it. It was it was a really easy postpartum. And so because I had had such an easy pregnancy, uh, I, I wanted to do it again really quickly. Um, but my partner was not into that. He wouldn't. He didn't want another baby yet. And so my first thought was, oh, I'll just have a baby for someone else. <laughs> and so I started looking into surrogacy. And um, I should mention here to anyone listening that it is not advised to have a surrogacy before you have completed your family. Right. Yeah, I've definitely heard that before. I do not advise doing what I did, but I was, I guess, young and ignorant. <laughs> How old were you at this point? I was 24 at this point. Okay. Um, so yeah, pretty young. And yeah. and I will say that the the agency I used, they did tell me that I would be okay. So I kind of leaned on that when they, mm. you know, they really shouldn't have done that. Yeah. But I did. And so I found an agency and uh, I looked at profiles and really quickly, this profile for a single gay man from Spain jumped out at me. We had very similar views on life and he, he wanted to have like a really close relationship, lots of stuff that sounded really appealing to me. And so I started talking to him and very quickly I was like, yeah, this, this man is amazing. And so after talking to him for a few weeks, we decided to go forward with it and I was going to be his surrogate. So from there we did legal. I went and I had uh, my medical check uh, over at the place where we do the transfer, which was in Vancouver. And I started my medications and everything was looking good. So he had uh, five embryos at the time uh, at the clinic. And so we went there and they chose just whichever one looked the highest grade. And uh, I brought a friend for the transfer and and uh, it went really smoothly. Not too much to it. Uh, we stayed in Vancouver for the day, kind of hung out and then uh, flew back home to Calgary. Waited a few days and I started testing pretty quickly because um, <laughs> I was very excited. And after I think five days post-transfer, I got that very first faint positive. And I uh, was very excited to tell the father. He was very excited. And yeah, uh, we we went into the pregnancy. I was pregnant. He missed the very first ultrasound, which was just six weeks to confirm uh, just the heartbeat confirmation. He was living in Ireland at the time, but he flew to Calgary for every ultrasound, um, which was just incredible. Yeah. How long is that flight? It's a long flight. Yeah. and But he was there, I think, for the eight and 12 and 20 week ultrasounds. He flew in for all of those. Oh. And it was really, really wonderful to get to meet him in person for the first time. Yeah, We got along so well. And it was just amazing to be at those scans with him and see how excited he was uh, about meeting his, uh, his baby. And then we did find out that it was a girl. And so the, the pregnancy was, was great. Uh, everything was going so smoothly. We had planned for uh, her to be born at the birthing center here in Calgary. We had checked it out. We were all set for that. And then I got into my third trimester. And one night I started feeling really itchy. My palms of my hands and the, and the soles of my feet. And I looked it up and I immediately discovered that it sounds like cholestasis of pregnancy. And I was like, no, uh-uh. I was, I was devastated, but, uh, I got to my next midwife appointment and I told them what was going on and they immediately were very on high alert. They sent me for, for blood tests and it came back very quickly that I had cholestasis quite badly. So immediately I had to now, um, do shared care. I could, luckily I could stay with my midwives, uh, but I also had to be in OB care. So I started seeing an OB and, uh, I started having blood draws and ultrasounds every two weeks to monitor my levels. I was put on a medication, which did help bring things down to a stable level. And the ultrasounds looked great. She was measuring a bit on the large side, but uh, not terribly. And um, the father was, of course, informed and he was nervous, but, you know, he was really, really wonderful about it all. And uh, it was decided uh, with cholestasis, you want to be induced by 37 weeks generally. So that was the plan. I was going to be induced at 37 and four. And so a week before the induction, the father flew in. His name is David, by the way. Um, he flew in with his parents and they were going to be staying to help him out with the baby after she was here. So a week later, I went in for the induction and uh, they used Cervidil. And so they put it in and I waited an hour and I started to feel a little bit crampy. 
but nothing too bad. And so they said, okay, you can go home for the night. And if things get crazy, then you can come back in. So I left and we ended up just staying at a hotel that was like across the street from the hospital because um, the hospital that I was at was on the opposite side of the city, which for me is about a 45 minute drive. Uh, So the father uh, got us a room in the hotel so that we could be nice and close. We went in there and immediately, even just on the walk to the hotel, things started to really pick up. And we know now from my first birth that I have really close together contractions right away. It's They aren't really a, a determining factor of where I'm at in my birth because I don't get those 10 minute apart contractions. They start quickly and they just kind of stay quick the entire birth. Um, so we get to the room and they're sporadic and not too bad. So I... Uh, I get into the shower and my boyfriend goes off and he grabs something to eat and I call my doula because I I ended up getting a doula for this birth. So she arrives and we hang out for a few hours and we we were concerned because we didn't know it was my second birth, which can go a lot faster, of course. So when my contractions were getting quite close together, but again, not too bad, we were like, oh, do do we, should we go in and get checked? We're not too sure. We decided to do it. We go in and they're really close together at this point and getting pretty intense. So I go into triage and they check me and I've gone from three centimeters to four centimeters. And they said that I had a hyperstimulated uterus is, I believe that's what they, um, they said because the, the cervidil was causing my uterus to contract really quickly, but not super efficiently. So they took out the Cervidil and they said, okay, we're going to admit you to the hospital. So we go into the room and in this, this hospital is just amazing. It's one of the newest in Calgary. They have huge rooms with like a full bed for your partner. They have bathrooms that are big enough to blow up a birthing pool. uh, And they have birthing pools there at the hospital. So I get into the pool and my contractions start to slow down. And so we're like, okay, let's get you out. And so I get out and I'm moving around and I can, I can feel them, but they are getting slower. And so they say, okay, after, after, after quite, quite some time, we did try a lot of positions. They said, we'd like to try breaking your water. And I said, yeah, let's, let's try that. It had been at least, I I can't, it, it had been a very long time. And so they break my water and immediately the contractions ramp up intensely they were crazy. Um, uh, they felt almost unbearable really quickly. Uh, so I was on the ball, I was in the shower and I, I said, I'd like to get back in the tub because these are really intense. And they go, Oh, well, because your water's been broken, we actually don't let you back in the, in the pool anymore, which I was very upset about because no one told me that when they broke my water. That's so frustrating, especially after your first birth where you had that water policy sprung on you at the last minute too. The amount of times I heard hospital policy the whole time I was there, I I cannot even, it made me furious. And the nurse, unfortunately, really didn't feel like she was on my side about a lot of things. It didn't feel like she was on the same page as me because I really wanted an unmedicated birth again. And so anyways, we, I labor for a little while with my water broken and the contractions are, though they're more intense, they're not getting closer together. They're still quite slow. And so they say the magical words, we want to start Pitocin. And it was really frustrating because it, it, it's interesting when you're giving birth as a surrogate because it's it's still your body, of course, but it's not your baby that's inside of you. And so you feel a little bit like you don't have control of a lot of things. There were a lot of points in this birth where I would have told them to take a hike, but I couldn't because it wasn't my baby and that, that wasn't really my decision. So... They say they want to start Pitocin, and I know that Pitocin is crazy. And uh, and I knew that I was already at my limit with the contractions as they were. So even though I was strongly against, just for myself, against getting a epidural, I decided to get it because it had been about 20-ish hours at this point or so, and I was just exhausted, and I felt like I could not handle those Pitocin contractions. So they get the epidural in me, and um, it, of course, feels incredible. It worked really quickly, and they start with the Pitocin, and as soon as that epidural was was fully, fully in, I just crashed, and I slept. 
for two hours. And I think everyone in the room got a little bit of a nap. Uh, there was my mom, my partner, my doula, and, um, and a photographer. We had a photographer as well. The father, I had planned for him to be at the birth when it was going to be out of the hospital. Um, but as soon as things felt, as soon as things were in the hospital where I didn't want to be and they felt out of control, I decided that I would prefer for him to just wait um, in the waiting room with his parents. And he was really, really gracious about that. He said, yep, whatever makes you feel the most comfortable. He was just amazing. So I sleep for a few hours and when I wake up, I feel a lot of pressure. And so they check me and uh, I've gone from, I, I, I never progressed past that four centimeters, by the way, when I got back to the hospital, um, it, my body just stalled from those four centimeters. So uh, they check and they're like, yep, you're complete. Cause I, cause my body was finally able to relax and they said, okay, we're going to go get the OB and uh, we're going to, you know, get you ready to deliver. And so I, really wanted to try squatting again. I certainly didn't want to be on my back with my legs up in stirrups. Uh, so the OB comes in and I tell her that I want to try squatting. And she's like, oh, well, I'm worried about this. And I'm worried about that. Um, but if you can squat without any assistance from anyone else, then sure, you can. And I'm like, okay, that's ridiculous. And so I do. And I, and I do. I can squat and I can pull myself back up onto the bed after the contraction. But she's like, mm, no, I'm worried about your knees or something, which was weird. And so... They did it so skillfully. Each contraction, they would lay me back further and further. And then my legs went up and start like it, it happened so seamlessly. I didn't even notice it. And so I pushed for about an hour and then she was starting to crown. So I reached and this time I did reach down and I felt her head being born and everything seemed normal to me. But uh, according to other people around me now, there was starting to be concern and so I had talked to the father and we had talked about me catching uh, the baby and he was okay with it. And so I reached down to, to catch her because she was about to be born and the OB smacked my hands away <laughs> and she said no. And I was like, excuse me, like, cause no one was telling me what was happening. Now I know that they suspected she had shoulder dystocia. But no one was communicating that to me, and maybe they were doing that because they didn't want me to panic. And they did. And the, the father was in the room by the by now. By the way, he was sitting right next to me for the pushing stage. But none of this, this was communicated. So all of a sudden, her head is out, and then on the next contraction, a couple of nurses now just like yank back on my legs as I push, and out she flew, no problem. Thank goodness. Um, they they suspected dystocia, but she came out with no problems. Uh, so she was laid on my chest and they cut the cord. And as soon as the cord was cut, they wrapped her up and they, and they gave her right to her father, which was just um, amazing to watch uh, her go to her dad for the first time. And he was so happy. And so I was caught up watching them. And all of a sudden I notice, I feel a tugging and I look down and the OB is pulling, pulling on the cord of the placenta. And I'm like, and, and it was, it was kind of like this cool moment where I crashed back into my body and I was like, this is my body again. This, I'm no longer <laughs> housing someone else's baby. And I looked at, I'm like, stop. And she, and she looked at me and I'm like, yeah, I need you to like, if there's no reason that you need to be doing that, then please stop pulling on my placenta and just let it come as it needs to be. And she looked a little grumpy with that, but she sat back and, of course, the placenta was delivered just fine a few minutes later. And, and yeah, um, there, there was a lot of people in the room. <laughs> there was my midwives, there was the father, his parents, and then, of course, all of my support team. It was a packed room. And the plan had been for us to stay at the hospital for a little while uh, after she was born but there wasn't a room for the father to stay in and it would have been a lot for him to stay in the room I was with. So luckily at this point, my nurse had switched off to a new one and this one was just absolutely, I loved her so much. And she was like, hey, if you can get up and walk yourself to the washroom three times and show me that like, you know, everything's working, that you can pee, I will get you out of this hospital as soon as I can. And I was like, deal. <laughs> so I drank lots of water and uh, I got out of the, and I was able to get out of bed, no problem, and use the washroom. And um, there was this really beautiful moment. Uh, both of uh, David's parents, 
uh, from Spain, they didn't speak any English. And so this whole time we hadn't really been able to communicate much. The, the father did speak English though, um, but his parents didn't. And I, it was, it was interesting being a surrogate because, you know, once you give birth, the attention is of course on the baby for the most part and which was okay. I didn't mind, but I came back from the washroom one of those times and I sat down, uh, I laid down on the bed and I'd been wearing these fuzzy socks when I was ever in bed and his mother walked over to me and she looked at me and she just kind of gently tapped my feet and the socks to like, ask me like if I wanted them to be back on. And I said, I shook my head. Yes. And she so tenderly put them back onto my feet and it was just this really beautiful moment of really being seen by her. And I, I don't know, something about that memory. I really treasure it. Yeah, that's so sweet, With especially with the language barrier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, I don't know. So the, the nurse held true to her word, even though I'd have had an epidural, which normally you'd stay in the hospital for at least 12 hours. Uh, she was able to get us out in four and a half hours. And so we packed up. And the plan had been for uh, the father and I to stay in the same hotel with side-by-side rooms uh, for the next three days because he, uh, I was going to breastfeed. And so we go back to the hotel and that's kind of where we hung out for the next three days um, while I recovered. My midwives just came to my hotel room to check up on me. Uh, and, and David was really amazing about it all. He never hovered. Like he would just bring the baby to me whenever she needed to to nurse and he would just be like, okay, here you go. And he would just go back to his room. Then I would text him when she was done and he would come back and get her. And he never hovered. He never made me feel anything less than completely comfortable. And I, I thank him so much for that all the time. And yeah, so uh, she nursed for three days, uh, brought in my milk amazingly. And then they went and they stayed in a uh, an Airbnb downtown Well, I went home and I continued to pump uh, while they stayed here. And they were here for about three weeks. And I just delivered milk to them or he would come and pick up every once in a while. And um, and yeah, that was that was kind of it. All right. So you mentioned that you wouldn't recommend doing a surrogacy before you're done having your own children. What was your reasoning for that? after the fact. Oh yeah. So, well, the the reasoning is because, um, you have to take so many hormones Mm -hmm. during the surrogacy process Mm -hmm. and those hormones can sometimes cause your own body to like stop producing them. Mm. Or it's just the fact that surrogacy is just a more risky pregnancy Yeah, and things can happen and it can cause you to not be able to carry another baby again. Yeah, or like the hormones can mess up your own and your body can have trouble carrying again or getting pregnant. Mm. So it's very not advised. Okay. All right. So we do know that you had another baby. So let's hear about that experience. Yeah, definitely. So uh, true to my word, um, it took a while for us to get pregnant. And uh, this, our, our first wasn't planned, but Lyndon was. And it took us over a year of trying, which was really discouraging and scary. And I wondered lots if, if it had anything to do with the surrogacy. I will never know. But I did finally fall pregnant. And um, I found out on my partner's birthday in September in, in um, 2021, found out I was pregnant very, very early because I, I knew I knew right away that I was that something about myself was off. And so I checked that night and I had the faintest, faintest second line, but I was <laughs> very excited, very excited to tell him. And um I had really bad morning sickness with this pregnancy. The other ones were pretty fine, but this one, oh man, oh man, it was rough. And um I had started my own pottery business, um, which I didn't mention. I started pottery while I was a surrogate, um, just at, like in a class, and it really took off. I decided in 2020 to open my own business, and uh, my pottery business really took off. So I was still having to force myself to go into the studio all the time to to do my work, and it was <laughs> the, the studio members could tell that I was not feeling so good every time I was there, but they were really wonderful and supportive of me and helpful in any way they could be. So I got through that first trimester and I started to feel much better right around the 12 week mark. And so things were looking great. And especially after having such a medicalized birth, I was so 
pumped to have like this beautiful home birth with my second. It was, I was going to catch my own baby. It was going to be in the water this time. It was going to be unmedicated. And I was so freaking excited about this birth. And so we went into the second trimester and everything was looking okay. And then we go to the 20 week appointment and I had been to enough ultrasounds by this point that I could tell immediately that something was off because they, they would look at the baby and they would look back at my placenta. They would look at the baby, they'd go back to the placenta. And, they would, and so they, they left the room after a while and I'm like, is something wrong? And they said, well, we can't, we can't say anything. And so they left the room and they came back and they had like the, the doctor with them that was, that was there and he could tell results. And he said, yeah, we can see that you have placenta previa. And I was like, you're kidding me. <laughs> of course I do. Of course I want my beautiful home birth. And I now have something that requires you must be in the hospital with placenta previa. Which for those who don't know, it meant that my placenta was covering my cervix, which makes it, of course, dangerous for a baby to come out uh, vaginally that way. So they said, you know, it, it's still very early uh, there's a good chance it could move later. We'll do some more scans. We'll see how it moves. And I was like, okay, sounds good. And so I felt pretty positive about it. And we get into later pregnancy and, um, we do some more scans and it's moved further across my cervix. And I was like, you're kidding me. <laughs> this is not what I wanted. This it's getting worse. So at this point, I had told myself, yep, this is this is it. I'm going to have a C-section. I, I never want an epidural, let alone a C-section, but here we are. This is nuts. And my midwives were just incredible about it. They were trying to support me as much as they possibly could. Um, I should say that I had a different team each time with each pregnancy, um, just because that's just how it worked out, not because I kept on moving teams. It's just my teams kept on switching. Um, but this team was the best I have had so far. I, they were incredible. And I had also, uh, once again, gone into shared care with OB. And this OB was amazing as well. Uh, my midwives described her as an OB that should have been a midwife <laughs> because she's so naturally minded. So I had talked to the OB at my appointment and I had said, at what point are you comfortable with me delivering vaginally? And she said, oh, if your placenta reaches like zero millimeters, like right at the edge of your cervix, which from what I understand now is not common at all. So I continue getting scans and amazingly, the next scan, it's moved like a lot. And I get really excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's moving the right way. And I get the next scan and it's now moved off my cervix. It's at zero millimeters. And I'm just like, I, I think I was at 30-ish weeks at this point, maybe 33. And I was just ecstatic. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's moving so fast. There, it's it's going to move out of the way. And if it moves to two centimeters out of the way, then you can have a home birth. And so I'm just getting stoked. I'm telling everyone, yeah, we're going to have our home birth. This is going to happen. And so I continue going to scans and it stops moving. This, <laughs> this freaking placenta sits, it moves right to zero millimeters, like right at the very, very edge of my cervix and it stops moving. And I was just so intensely frustrated to, I, I can't even tell you how frustrated I was. So, and they said, there's no way it's going to move at this point. We're not going to give you any more scans. And I demanded more scans. I said, no, we're going to keep on checking till I have this baby, because if I can attempt a vaginal birth, we're going to do it. And so I, like I had mentioned, the OB had said that I could attempt a vaginal birth at zero millimeters. Well, I talked to her and she said, you know, it, it is your body, um, but it's extremely risky. You, you could, we, like, there's such a high risk of hemorrhage. And so she kept on leaving the decision in my hands. And I'm so thankful she did that. But at the same time, I was intensely confused on what I should do. I wanted so badly to not have a C-section, but at the same time, I didn't want to put myself or my baby's life in danger. So I continue along. I keep on getting scans. It's not moving. And then at 39 weeks and five days, I go in and I'm actually going to the hospital for my scan today. Normally it was at a clinic, but I went to the hospital for this scan and it happened to be the hospital I was supposed to deliver at. 
for one last ultrasound to see, is it going to move? Maybe, maybe a miracle happened. And so I go in for the scan and they said, yep, it's still at zero. And we recommend that you have a C-section. I'm like, okay, well, thank you for checking. And when they do these scans in later pregnancy, they like to look for something called practice breathing. They like to watch baby's diaphragm to make sure that they're practicing for if they need to deliver early or come early. And they checked and they noticed that he wasn't doing his practice breathing. He was, he was moving and he was fine. And, but they liked to look for that. And they said, okay, well, we, we tried for a while. They tried poking him. They tried getting him to move. And he was just sleepy. So they said, we're going to hook you up to a non-stress test just in the next room, just to like do some kick counts for a little bit. I was like, yeah, that's fine. So they hooked me up and I lay there for 10 minutes, clicking the little button every time he kicks. And he's, he's of course, awake now and he's kicking up a storm. And after 10 minutes, the nurse comes in and she's like, we're just going to roll you onto your side. And they don't say much. I said, okay, that's fine. And so they leave and they come back 10 minutes later. And they're like, yeah, your baby's heart rate keeps on dropping. I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's odd. Because he had always been fine with whenever we had checked his heart. And they said, yeah, we're just going to take you down to triage and we're going to hook you up to the monitor for a little while longer. And I said, okay. Well, we can we can do that. And so at this point, I'm getting a little concerned. And it had been on mute while I was in that other room, but they hooked me up at triage uh, to the non-stress test. And this time they had the, the volume up. I could hear his heartbeat. And they weren't lying. Almost every 10 to 15 minutes, I could hear his heart rate just drop right down. And it would always recover really quickly. But it just kept on dropping. I'm like, this is, this is not good. <laughs> So the OB on call comes and talks to me. She, she said, I can't induce you knowing that your placenta is so close. We can't do that. So we want to do a C-section today. And so I talked to my midwives a bit about it. And I talked to my partner. And ultimately, when she came in to check me, I was, I was in that room for like four hours. It was a very long time. Ultimately, she came back in and she said, so what are we going to do? And I said, yep, we're going to we're going to do the C-section today, which was very emotional for me because I had hoped with every bit of my soul that it wouldn't come to that. But we were there. We needed to do it. So I called my partner and my midwives and I said, you need to get your butt down here because they wanted to do it. Like it wasn't an emergency, but it was an urgent C-section. They said, OK, we can give you like two hours to gather your people and then we're going to go down. So they moved me to a room, hooked me back up, and my midwife arrived, my partner arrived. Of course, my partner, I call him, and he's like installing the car seat because we had waited till the last minute. And so he books it down, and he arrives. Uh, they get him all dressed up in his scrubs, and uh, they get me all dressed up, and they said, okay, it's, it's time to go down. And so we go down, and they, they numb me, and... They lay me down and I could, I could feel right away. I told them, I said, I can feel a little bit on my left. And I guess the, the test is that they do the first cut. And if you don't jump out of your seat, then they say that you're good to go. But I, it didn't feel right. Like I couldn't feel them cutting, but I was in a lot of pain. And I was saying to the nurse at my side and the anesthesiologist, I'm like, I, like this is really intense. I'm in a lot of pain here. And the anesthesiologist said, well, I can give you something, but it's going to pass to your baby at this point. And I said, okay, let's, let's wait till he comes. So they get through the C-section and they pull him out and I hear him cry. And he was, and thank goodness, because my, my midwife told me later that she was very nervous that with his heart rate, that things could go wrong when he was born. But nope, he was born just screaming. And uh, we didn't know the, the sex. Uh, we had kept it a secret. So they held him over the curtain for us and we got to see that we had another boy which was very exciting and uh, they took him off to be cleaned and and they did they, this hospital is wonderful they do delayed cord clamping with c-sections and they they try to do things as much to to bring me more comfort things like that then they do skin to skin they bring baby over to do a quick check and then they immediately bring baby to you and they lay baby skin to skin on your chest uh which was wonderful but i was still but now they had started you know putting me back together and I was in even more pain now and I couldn't breathe with him on my chest he was he was a decent size he was eight pounds one ounce and so I gave him to my partner and I 
finally said to the anesthesiologist, I'm like, I need something because I was, it's hard to describe, but it was, it was awful. And so he gives me something, which of course my body doesn't react very well to pain meds. And it made me start to throw up, which was equally as awful when you're laying on a table (coughs) on your back. But they uh, helped me through it and they gave me something for the nausea and then I, then it calmed down and I just got really tired and, you know, so they finished and I should mention with my other births, I had kept my placenta. It was very important to me that I kept my placenta with my first and my second birth. And I had mentioned it to lots of people and even the nurse, but my nurse switched right before the C-sections. The one who was there hadn't heard it. In any case, they moved me to recovery and I latch my baby and we, you know, he's skin to skin with me and he starts to nurse and I'm recovering very well. And I look at my midwife at some point and I said, well, what did they do with my placenta? And she gets the most panicked look on her face and she runs <laughs> full tilt back to the OR. But she came back and she said, yeah, they sent it off to pathology, which I'll just save you the time. They will, I, later, I will find out that they never sent it to pathology. They just threw it in the garbage. Mm. And they didn't, they never asked me. They never asked, I guess... <laughs> They say that they like put out a call to like, they just asked the room. No one in particular didn't, they didn't ask the person, of course, whose placenta it was. They didn't ask me directly, nor my partner, nor the midwife, who all would have absolutely said, save it. They just threw it in the garbage. And I guess that hurt the most because the C section was necessary. And I know that that it was. I didn't want it, but it was necessary to make sure my baby was delivered safely. Yeah. But that placenta did not have to go in the garbage. It didn't. And so I'm still, I, it took me a long time to to kind of get over that part. Yeah, that's so hard. I feel like it's one of those things that's just such a good reminder to care providers that one thing like that can really stick with someone about their birth experience, even though I'm sure, you know, no one at the hospital thought twice about it again. Um, I'm sorry that that was something that you had to deal with and process. You know, it is what it is. And so they brought me back up to my room and uh, I recovered, you know, quite well for the next few days. They kept me there and then, uh, and baby, you know, latched on great. He was nursing really well. And, uh, and yeah, that was it. Okay. Well, yeah, a very different experience for all three of your births for sure extremely. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for sharing all these different stories with us. I really appreciate hearing your perspective. Do you want to share where listeners can find you? Yeah. So like I was saying, I do make pottery and my pottery, it like, it celebrates birth and the feminine body. I make mugs with placentas, with vulvas, with breasts, uh, with uteruses. And I can be found on Instagram at fruit of the womb underscore art. Love it. That's such a fun name. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I definitely think you'll have some listeners who are into that kind of art. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, Enya. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to chat with Megan about Aeroflow Breast Pumps, today's sponsor, and to get your free pump through insurance as well as other things like maternity compression garments and lactation education and support, head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. All right, let's hear from Megan. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Aeroflow. I'm so excited to talk to you. Hi, Bryn. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you before we get into our chat about Aeroflow breast pumps? Of course, I have three kids. My oldest is four. She was born in 2017. And then we, um, my middle is two. And then my youngest is brand new. She, he is six weeks old. All right. So tell us about how you discovered Aeroflow breast pumps and uh, why you decided to use them to get your breast pump. Well, so I discovered Aeroflow through your podcast, of course, Good. <laughs> so, which I listen to religiously. <laughs> um, I didn't discover, fortunately, I didn't discover your podcast until I was pregnant with my second. Um, okay. And so I started using it with with, um, with my second and then also with my third. Um, and with my first, <laughs> I of course, didn't know about Aeroflow. And so I just got the prescription from the doctor and was sent to a medical supply store, had a 
wait in line. It was just given this like brown box. <laughs> I didn't have any choice about which breast pump I was going to get. Um, so I didn't really know any better. So when I found out about Aeroflow, um, I was like, well, it's, it's almost seemed too good to be true. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> And uh, it was awesome. So it, it, it was exactly what you said it was going to be. It was pretty incredible. That's really cool. I haven't talked to anybody who has done it without Aeroflow and with. So I'm excited to uh, hear how that was different for you. So um, for those that don't know, can you just kind of explain the process for getting your breast pump uh, for free through Aeroflow breast pumps? Sure. So I logged into the website. I typed in some of my information. I think I needed my um, my insurance information, um, due date, things like that. And then just press submit. And I think honestly, within maybe a day, maybe two days, I heard back via email and they had, they contacted my insurance company and everything. I didn't need to actually even give them a prescription. I think they contacted my midwife. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, they, first they said it was just kind of in process. And then maybe a day or two later, um, I got to access my personal page that had choices of probably a dozen different breast pumps that I had to choose from. Some were free, some were for an upcharge. So it was really cool. And then I could take the time and kind of research which ones I wanted and which ones would best suit what I needed. So it was really incredible versus my first time, which I was just literally just handed a brown box. <laughs> like, this is what you get. <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, so that was really incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that they contact your care provider for you and your insurance and everything because just the last thing you want to be doing is making another call or figuring out how to fax something to somebody or whatever. So that part was really nice for me and especially that they work with um, midwives as well as, you know, a, a doctor's office or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know. And I'm not um, savvy with insurance. So or is any anybody, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they make my, it really hard. <laughs> not my jam. And so I don't even know, honestly know how they, they did it, but they did it, it yeah. again. Like, it, um, there are very few things that I try to give advice about to people who are pregnant, like pregnant ladies. <laughs> we already have too much advice that it's unsolicited advice coming in from people. Yeah. But the two things are always aeroflow in the birth hour. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> you have I to love know. It. Because I don't think some, a lot of the people I've actually told about Aeroflow have never even heard of it. I'm like, this you guys have to check this out. It sounds too good to be true, but really this is what you should do. Yeah. So. Well, I love that. Thanks for spreading the word. <laughs> yeah. Um, what pump did you end up going with for your second and then did you get a new one for your third? I did. So this is kind of funny. So um I I was between the Spectra, I used the Medela with the, my first time around. And then, um, overwhelmingly advice I got was to get the Spectra, but I ended up with a Luna motif based on uh, your podcast. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I, I ended up with the Luna motif and I was really happy with that. And then the third time around, um, I actually did the super upcharge and got the hands-free one. Um, I think I went with the Willow, Okay. Um, so I'm still figuring that one out, <laughs> but I'm only, <laughs> I'm six weeks postpartum. So there's a bit of a learning curve with it. And so, um, I'll go back to work in, you know, a few months. So I'll hopefully figure it out by then. Awesome. That's so funny. I think I have done the exact same path as you. I started with a Medela and again, it was just handed to me in a brown box. And then uh -huh. I got, um, a Spectra with my second, I guess. And then, um, the Luna from Motif with my third when that came out. So how, um, how funny. Yeah. <laughs> and the Luna was definitely my favorite by far. So yeah, it was incredible. I know. And it was just funny. Cause like I said, a lot, cause I think the Luna wasn't as well known. And maybe it's the Spectra and the Medela. Right. And so, you know, maybe I think I took it to my Facebook page. Like, anyone have any recommendations? And like, overwhelmingly, like, it was the Spectra. And I was like, mm, I'm going to go with the Luna Motif. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, based on all of the podcasts I listened to, I was like, I'm going to go with Britain's opinion on this one. And I, I was happy with it. So awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I really appreciate your time today. All right. All right. Brent, take care. 
Thank you so much again to Enya for sharing her stories with us and to Aeroflow for sponsoring this episode. Remember to go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get started getting your pump and other free things like lactation services for free through insurance. You can find more information from today's episode by heading over to thebirthhour.com and searching for Enya's name in the search bar to find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.